Tom Lang, you said it so well. Indeed, there is progress in this space. Progress because of access, progress because of skills. This is the setup now, Chris. Progress because of the software. But each of those individually is not enough. So the progress that we have seen with the, with the previous panel, the progress we have seen with the ISVs include those three things, but the other piece, back to my multicolored four people in the room, not just three, we've got to have the right business models and the business discussions to pull it off. So the progress that had happened in the past two years with access to Blue Waters, with the talent in the room, with the coders who actually knew that code is spectacular. But it was not a happy accident that this group, this collaboration model happened. That was intentional. And it was because of the trust of you in this room to pull some of that off. Some of the things I'm most proud of here and has been said in the past couple of years, we, we, we are proud of the fact that partners stay partners with us and have hung around for a while. But one of the comments that, has, that I'm most proud of is, oh, we didn't sell this to our board because we trust you. Well, although we, th we think that's true, it's because we trust each other. So this collaboration that we talked about was real trust between the par parties. Tom, you said it so well. We got competing ISVs on the panel also trusting that we can do things that they can benefit from. So this trust matters. Lynn said it too this morning. Well, I didn't expect to come to a geek fest and talk about behavior. But we did. So that said, some more behavioral things are going on and the understanding and the insights that must happen to be able to change this game, the Council on Competitiveness took this on. So the co-chairs of the Council on Competitiveness HPC Advisory Committee were deeply involved in this and wanted to pursue these three things. And Chris will tee this up a little bit better in just a moment. But I really do want to thank Donna Crawford from Lawrence Livermore in leading some of this and co-chairing that committee, as well as Michael McQuaid from United Technologies. So this is an example. The committee itself is an example of bridging academic and industry interests and to have the head of R&D at UTC and Donna from Lawrence Livermore agree on some things with the rest of us in the room, that's a happy day. So I do want to, uh, and, and Cynthia, you and I have been working for quite a while. Your predecessor, Susie Titchener, was part of that slog fest we had seven years ago in here with, with, you know, with the ISVs. We've had these conversations with the council for quite some time. So we need a mouthpiece. We need to touch Washington. And we have done a, a, a fair bit of that. So this panel represents the people who attended all three meetings and got involved from the get-go, et cetera, et cetera. So these three meetings, Chris will tee it up, were actually tasked to talk about the software issues and the software barriers at some scale. So what's the holy grail? Well, we're not sure we have the answer to that yet, but we have a start. So to share with us that start is Chris Mustaine from the Council on Competitiveness. Thank you, Merle. So as he indicated, I'm going to sort of tee up the conversation a little bit by putting the software working group of the Council on Competitiveness in a little bit of context and tell you, for some of you who aren't familiar with us, who we are and what we're doing in HPC. So the council, we're going to celebrate our 30th uh, anniversary next year. We're a unique alliance in Washington. We uh, combine chief executive officers from company. Our chairman is Sam Allen of John Deere. Uh, we also have university presidents, including Bob Easter of the University of Illinois. Uh, the chairman of our labor group is uh, Bill Height of the Plumbers and Pipefitters Union. And uh, for the lab directors who are partners with the council, um, we have a, a representation of Lawrence Livermore there, of course. Uh, so this unique pairing, what we found is if you can get these entities agreeing on what's good for the future of the country, it has a lot of resonance with folks in the administration, with folks in the Congress, and it allows us to build the sort of partnerships independent many times of government involvement to make progress on the issues that we've talked about today. 
So I'm going to talk a little bit about our HPC initiative. It's got three main components, and I'll cover them uh, very quickly. One, uh, where Cynthia was our leader, is the Endemic Initiative. Uh, I'm very proud that we have a representative from Rosenboom who participated in that with us today. Um, that was an effort to uh, help uh, small and medium-sized manufacturers, manufacturers use modeling and simulation. That stands for the National Digital Engineering and Manufacturing Consortium, is what Endemic stands for, uh, and a great success. We also are operating under a grant from the U.S. Department of Energy, uh, looking not only to support and advise them through our HPC, CAC, but also to perform original research, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And then, of course, Merle talked to you about the High Performance Computing Advisory Committee chaired by Donna Crawford of Livermore, uh, Michael McQuaid of UTC, and then also uh, Steve Coonan from New York University in the center. Okay. So very quickly about Endemic, uh, as you can see from this slide here, we had uh, four principal industry investors in the initiative. We had two state investors, and that funding was roughly matched by the Economic Development Administration at the Department of Commerce. We had several key solution partners, including uh, NCSA, and uh, also service providers. And this was to provide the support and the access to the computing that was necessary for these uh, small and medium-sized manufacturers to move forward. and derive value. So what are the results? Let's get right to the, the, the nut of this issue. If you look on the left there, 20 projects pursued, 16 completed. Take a look at those results just from 16 projects the first time through. When we talk about this with policymakers, we often tell them to imagine if we had a thousand small manufacturers and what the impact of that would be. This is the first step on a long journey. This is something that we looked at as starting the conversation about what's the return on investment for getting into this? What does this mean for the competitiveness of these firms? Uh, we can go into detail with you offline about some, some more of the competitiveness benefits of this, but we thought the numbers spoke for themselves very effectively. <coughs> Secondly, the Extreme Computing and U.S. Competitiveness Grant with the Department of Energy. Uh, recently, we issued a report, I think it was last November, called Solve. It's available on the Council website, www.compete.org. Uh, we partnered with a research firm, Internet360, to uh, interview over 100 companies. And what we were trying to do with this report was it's fairly well understood about what the mandate to move toward X-scale computing is for national security and what that means for basic science. Less well understood was what the move to the next level of computing means for economic competitiveness and for companies. And so that was the focal point of this survey. And again, this is available online at the council. As you can see, among those 100 firms, uh, HPC users, all of them, we hit a variety of industries. We also had a variety of firms and their usage. I'm going to show you just a few slides from that report uh, because we want to get to more, but especially some related to software. This one may take a little while to get into your head a little bit, but it's a very interesting graphic that looked at different industries and what their software usage was in terms of a mix of open source software, commercial ISV software, and then also in-house proprietary software. What we found across industries is that virtually all of them are roughly a third for each of those three things. If you look at the bands there, once you take a look at the graphic more closely, you'll see that each of the dot for industry falls roughly between the 20 and 40th percentile node. And so what our takeaway from this is that the solution on software is going to have to be multi-pronged. It's going to have to cover all three of these bases in terms of thinking about what are the strategies to enable us to leverage them more effectively. A second thing was just how big a problem is software in moving to greater scalability. And you know, one of the questions was, what are the barriers to getting 10x greater scalability? Well, the number one response was get the scalability of the software. This, this survey was completed mid last year. And as you can see, if you look at the dark uh, bands on the right-hand side of that bar where it's significant limitation or, or you know, significant, the highest level for that is under uh, software. And we found the same trend line when you looked at barriers to 100x that we looked at as well. Oops, went backwards. Uh, and lastly, this one doesn't relate directly to software, but to the primary mission of the report was to say it is important for industry moving toward uh, exascale computing. And the, the point of this was that we asked them, you know, do you see for your most challenging applications, could you use 10, 100, 1,000 X performance improvements uh, over the next five years? And we thought it was pretty striking that uh, over two thirds said 10 X yes, 
Over half of the companies surveyed said they could use a 100x performance increase in five years, and over a third said that they could use a 1,000x performance within five years. So this speaks to how quickly the technology advances that we drive through the Department of Energy and the federal government tend to translate into the marketplace and is utilized because there's a demand there from industry. So with that, I'm going to set this up for Fred. We, under our HPCAC, have set up three working groups. As you can see, Fred uh, is our chair for software. Uh, Gary Mastin from Lockheed Martin heads up our one on industrial access to some of these top systems. And Rick Arthur from GE heads up our work on skills and several of the issues surrounding that. So uh, we would invite many of you in the audience today, if you're interested in some of the work we're doing, to contact us. We can talk about that. And perhaps it would be great to have you participate in it. And with that, I'll turn it over to Fred. Thanks very much, Chris. Thank you. We'll do a seamless technology transfer here. And there's no IP involved. IP is coming. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, perfect. All right. So, uh, as, as Chris said, uh, the council set up three working groups to explore what are the, the three by now well-known uh, barriers to adoption of high-performance computing by industry that came out much earlier in the, in the COMPETE report. Uh, access, accessibility to hardware, uh, accessibility to st appropriate staff, and accessibility of scalable software. And I was asked to chair the software working group to explore this issue. Um, so first thing we did was, well, what are we, tr what are we trying to do? We, we, we took as a premise and you know this was not a this was this point was not debated. Our opening stance was that yeah, increasing the use of high performance computing by American industry is a good thing. This is something that we want to do. This is an American competitiveness issue. Um, so that was that was just our opening our opening statement. You walk in. This is everyone there was trying to increase the use of high performance computing by American industry in a variety of of, of, of guises. Um, the original members were myself. Uh, Steve Ashby at PNL, uh, Mohammed from John Deere, and Merle Giles from NCSA. Uh, and the first thing we realized is that we didn't have anybody from the ISV community, which is since we're going to be talking about software, we sort of need to do that first. So, the first thing we did was expand our working group to create a sort of a, 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 a functioning team that, that contained a little more representation. So to our group, we added uh, the illustrious Rick Arthur from GE, uh, Professor Carruthers at RPI, and then Steve Feldman, who's in the audience, uh, from CD Adapco, and Barb Hutchings from, uh, from ANSYS. And then we set about trying to, trying to figure out what we were actually going to do to address this issue. The original th thinking was that we were going to hold a one single workshop, uh, but I think motivated in part by, by experiences with previous single workshops, we decided that was not such a good idea because we'd get the same answers from the same people again. So. We said instead, we're going to go around the country and do small working group discussions. We wanted, you know, 10 people, 12 people, 20 people, no more than that, around a table um, where we could talk in a non-attributional sense about what actually works. Uh, and so, and we would just collect the information and report back to the council, and we'll have filed some of the, some of the edges off. Um, we, I, I briefed this to the council uh, in November, right after we had finished. Uh, Rick and I uh, ran a, a BOF session at Supercomputing mere days later, um, so we had really hadn't formulated much of much thoughts yet. We still were in the middle of, of collating it, um, and now I'm, I'm, I'm going to share some of the findings here with you to get your your input. And I think following on the discussion that happened just before lunch, uh, where we can see some some successful partnerships that 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 move the needle in terms of, of pushing software into a highly scalable regime, I think that that sets the tone for some of what we're going to talk about here. Um, so, mix of people. We had one late August in Washington. Uh, we had one in September at Argonne, and one in, in later September at Lawrence Berkeley. And the, the objective, like it says, is to is just try to answer the question of what's going wrong. Why doesn't this work right now? Uh, and and how do we how do we move the needle forward? Where are the barriers? I, it, over lunch, I was having a conversation with uh, w w with some of the members of the. Of the of my working group, and I think that if we were to have those three discussions starting now, like of a first one now and the next one a couple months from now, I think we would actually have a slightly different discussion because I think the feeling in the community has actually shifted somewhat. So you're going to see, a I'm going to talk a lot about the potential problems and the barriers that, that, that are present, and then 
I'd like this to be a much more uh, a collaborative discussion as we think about possible solutions going forward. Um, so first, two were the participants. Well, it was a long list. I'm not going to go through them all. Uh, we intentionally had a mix of ISVs involved. We had a mix of national labs and academics involved. Uh, there was government involvement, uh, and there was uh, there was a fair amount of private industry. Uh, I should point out that that in the meeting we had in Washington D.C., we actually had a follow-on meeting in Washington, taking advantage of the location, where we talked with uh, some of the regulatory agencies, so people from from FERC and from FDA and, uh, and from NIH and and, and um, and there were transportation. And transportation. Uh, because high performance computing, or I should say modeling and simulation writ large, is something that's going to start playing a larger and larger role in the regulatory industry. I mean, you think just, just take pharma as a clear example. There's a lot of push right now to do more in silico testing of drugs, but that information isn't actually accepted at the FDA, and so that limits the utility of something like that. And we're in conversation constantly with the FDA to try to move, move that needle forward, and that's a completely different uh, uh, a topic. So I'm not going to touch more on that today, except that that's, that's also going on, and that will actually touch on, on many industry players as well. So format was fairly simple. Uh, we invited everyone together, and we asked a series of questions. And the first thing we asked was, what fails now? What are you doing that didn't work? And, uh, and, and, and can we understand what didn't work? And then are there policies that are hindering or are there policies that are helping? I mean, what can we do to, to, to engender change? And uh, finally, are, are there partnerships or collaborations that should exist, that don't exist, or, or, or that can be uh, um, uh, that can be helped. <laughs> ah, there's a word for that. Oh, well, that can be encouraged. That was the word. It, 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 in, in, collaborations that can be encouraged that would sort of move that needle forward. And finally, what resources are needle, needed and who needs to pay? Uh, and that's really the bottom line. At the, end, the, at the end of the day, and that was made clear, I think, at the end of the discussion just before lunch, you know, these changes are, this is real investment. Uh, it's, not, it's not easy going to the next, la next layer of computing, and that was something I sort of, it was on my slides, I didn't, I didn't uh, belabor the point, but so I'll, I'll take a moment just now. As many of you know, computing is actually going through a, sort of an architecture change right now. We're going from one paradigm of computing to another. Massively parallel computing, especially with, the, with, with heterogeneous computing, where it's going to be multiple layers of, of parallelism, is, very different, is a very different beast. That's a much harder animal to program for than we've been in the past. And I think that one of the things we're seeing now is companies see the, the, the capability that's offered, the, the immense power that's potentially available, but the software challenges are actually immense. And that was, you know, you heard Lane mention that and Steve mentioned that as well. It's a real investment by the software houses to make that change. These are not trivial. You don't just say, oh, I'm going to put some MPI calls in and it's going to work at 100,000 cores. It doesn't work that way. It do that doesn't even come close to working that way. <laughs> There's actually an enormous amount of work. There are going to be algorithm changes that are going to have to be invented in order to be able to take advantage of these new architectures. So now is a propitious time for us to look at how, we're, how we view engineering software in this country and how it affects our industry. So with all that as a backdrop, I'm going to take a few minutes and go through some of the common themes that emerged, and then I'm going to look at each of the sectors individually, the, the, the ISVs, the industry, academics, and government, and what they're, what the, what they're, those are the stakeholders. What is it they actually want uh, out, of, out of a change? So first, and this was ironic, coming, given that we were talking specifically about software as an issue, um, the, the theme that came up first and most vehemently at all three of the workshops was workforce. Workforce, workforce. There aren't enough people to do this. Um, there aren't enough people to do the, 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 the work inside the industry, so the houses that are writing their own code don't have the manpower. But that, you know, to extrapolate that now to the ISVs, whose job it is to write the software, they're not finding the people they need to who are actually uh, cognizant of, of next generation computing and how to take advantage of it. It is, in fact, a specialized skill. So. Um, I didn't actually give you much of an introduction to myself, so I work at Lawrence Livermore, we, where we have the benefit of having some of the world's largest computers always, uh, because that's sort of our job, uh, is to use those computers. As a result, we have a lot of people that come into the laboratory who we, who we have to train to use ridiculous levels of computing. And so I can say, you know, from point blank experience that nobody walks in, nobody walks in knowing how to program a million cores. It just doesn't happen. But they need to learn, and we train them. Uh, that, that is a process. It's an investment in manpower. 
you know, it makes the headlines when, when, when one of the labs goes out and spends 100 or $200 million on a computer. What's, what's, what doesn't make the headline is that roughly for every dollar that's spent by the weapons program on a computer, $2 are spent on people. Uh, because it's the people that actually matter. That's what makes it all work. So this workforce issue, which was not actually the topic of my, of my group, but came up over and over and over again. This is an important one. Um, we need to bring everyone to the table because an academic program needs to also jump forward a little bit. If they're going to be training people to be programming at that scale, they need to have access to the computers, something that NCSA does, in fact, very well here at Illinois. Um, so, uh, and we had anecdotes about, about uh, companies who actually invest in individual people. They sponsor a particular student in a program so that when he graduates they can hire him and they can train him because they've sort of followed his career for years at a time. That's, that's kind of a, I mean, that doesn't scale, right? Every company can't afford to do that. But, but, uh, but so, so we, need to, we need to think why is it they're driven to do that kind of, that kind of in, you know, uh, intrusive, intrusive uh, in, intruding themselves into the education process in order to get the people they need. So as I mentioned earlier, the changes in computing architecture are, are real and they're, yeah, they're, it's very disruptive. So something's going to have to happen. Uh, we're, most industry is still operating mostly, pretty much at the desktop level. And so they're using software that's, that, that, that's usually not even using MPI or it's barely using MPI. And as we were talking about at lunch, and I really appreciated the comments that were made in the previous panel about silly things like how you open your data file and read it in. You know, the, nobody thinks about that part of their code. That's the first, like, you know, 40 lines of code. And then there's the other million lines, and you don't worry about that first piece. But if you do that badly, it takes, like, 12 hours to read your input deck. And that's not tenable. On the other hand, if you do it not badly, it can take, like, three minutes. But you have to know how to do it not badly. And that's, in, you know, if you don't, then that's an entire research project just in itself. But there are organizations, like ours, like NCSA, that have beaten that problem because we do it day in and day out. And so there's, there's this technology that needs to transfer. Um, the pace of advance is leaving even the large companies behind. Uh, that was something that came up over and over again. We talk a lot about the small to medium-sized enterprises and, and or, uh, um, programs like Endemic, uh, which are really trying to bring them, you know, get them off of zero and start moving them along. And that's, and that's not just noble, that's, that's everything, right? That's, that is the driver of innovation in, in the United States. But the difference between the top, you know, the Forbes top 100 and these small to medium-sized enterprises used to be very large, and now it's not. I mean, there are a lot of companies in that range who, who don't function very differently from the small companies because they don't have access to the manpower, they don't have access to the computing, they don't have access to the software. And finally, and this is the a, 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 a last, last point that came up, is international competition is only increasing, and the ex to the extent that foreign nations are behaving more like corporate entities, uh, the competition is actually ridiculously fierce. I mean, here in the United States, we have companies competing against each other. But, you know, out, out, in, the, out in the real world, <laughs> we're competing against entire countries who can marshal all of their resources to act as a single entity. And that's, that's a competition we should be very frightened about. This is why you know, Council has spent so much of their time and energy looking at American competitiveness. It's not something that we, that we take for granted. And working at a security weapons establishment, you know, uh, that's something that I, that I it's, it's emblazoned in my forehead. Um, okay. Let's talk about the industry itself. So much, much of the industry that was at the workshops was manufacturing industry, but not all. Um, so this is going to have a certain manufacturing flavor to it. Um, something that came up over and over again was validated software. So why not just go, let's say, to uh, a national lab, for instance, and say, OK, well, you guys have a highly scalable code. Why don't we just use that to design our, our nuclear reactor? And the answer is, well, you could, except that the regulatory agency won't accept it because they've never seen the code before. And so that becomes a huge problem. This issue of having validated codes that give results that you're familiar with, that the industry is familiar with, that you know how to compare back and forth with each other, that's very important. Uh, workflow is something that Merle had mentioned uh, earlier. Workflow is a huge issue. I mean, you can't disrupt an industry of workflow with a new process. You don't do that lightly. And so you have to try to do this adiabatically as we move from, you know, single core to multi-core to, to mega, mega multi-core. Um, so the, the, this efficient software that fits into the existing workflow, the users typically adapt their behavior to their own workflow. And this is uh, 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 a, a comment that uh, we, I was having this discussion again over, over lunch. So 
we had, if you had access to the best software on earth and you could solve your problem almost exactly, but it was going to take you two months to do that, you wouldn't do it. Because you need your answer like in a day. And so you're going to make all the approximations. You, know, you're going to, you, you could model your product with, you know, with a million zones, but you're only going to model it with 10,000 because that's what fits. And then you're going to make all the approximations attendant to that. You're going to, you're, going to, you're going to cut off your boundary conditions because you have to. Things like this. This, this happens day in and day out inside of industry. They make the course approximations because they need the answer by tomorrow. The flip side of that, of course, is that they get the answer and they're like, well, it's sort of as close to experiment. Ah, that's about all you can expect from simulation anyway because that's all it can ever do. You know, that's, of course, not true at all. If you actually pay attention to the details and you put all the physics in and you remove your boundary conditions, then you can actually get very, very close to reality. Uh, and, and, you know, we, we, inside the labs, we do that all the time, but we do pay attention to those details. So another issue that came up, lack of interoperability between data sets, and this has to do with the proprietary nature of commercial code. Um, this, we didn't touch on this earlier. It'd be interesting to hear people's opinions on this. This is a, this is a, a tough topic, right? Um, so any industry that, that has to think about their, their entire vertical pipeline, they are there from, from you know, manufacturing their actual widget, whether it's a, a, a tractor or a jet engine or, 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 a, or an airplane, um, you have all the subcomponent manufacturers underneath and they're all using different codes with data sets that don't transfer. <laughs> And so that would, that's an enormous inefficiency in the system that could be, that could be ameliorated if there, was, if there was standards. And so that issue of standards came up. No accepted model for financial benefit. And this is something that's a funny statement, especially in this audience where most of you uh, appreciate a priori the value of simulation. But the fact is that as the comment that was made here that I thought was, was, was excellent, the costs are precise. You know, some, some accounting manager will tell you exactly how much it costs to have this many people buy that computer and run it. But the benefit of doing that is not always as precise, and it's usually owned by a different organization. So this part of the organization paid for it, and this part of the organization got the benefit. And that makes the, 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 the delicate politics inside organizations complicated around simulation. That's, um, that's uh, what was it? Someone said that, you know, we talk a lot about hardware, but most of his problem is software. It's all biology. <laughs> <laughs> the problem the problem is the people right getting people out of out of their stovepipes that's 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 a problem that industry faces and that's going to continue to face if we're going to start pushing beyond simulation as merely a sort of an eyeball for experiment and actually start using it the way we do inside the weapons program where we actually solve national you know problems of national implication directly on a computer because we believe the results and there's a lot of reasons we believe the results and and People could have those reasons as well, right? It's a matter of attention to detail. Um, so I mentioned earlier, large and growing a gap exists. Uh, uh, we, we have a real interest in getting companies off of zero, getting them moving along. But I'm going to spend most of the time uh, here, and I think we're going to talk, I'd like to have the discussion as we continue, mostly about the high end of computing. So, so I understand absolutely the need to get small and medium-sized companies off of the desktop up to, all, off, you know, up to 100 cores. That'd be a huge advantage. But I'm going to talk here about what it takes to get to higher levels of cores, re real extreme computing, the kind of stuff that we talked about just before lunch. The last thing I want to mention that came up that was, to me, a surprising thing um, was the importance of what I would call dull workloads. I think that was uh, Rick's, Rick's uh, term for that. Uh, unsexy stuff. Uh, how, do you do a, how, do you, how do you do mesh generation? How do you do mesh grooming? Well, if you're going to put you know, a, if a 300 million you know, zone calculation together, how you put that element, how you put that mesh together matters, right? I mean, and you can't do it by hand. A lot of, a lot of the, and I'm going to pick on meshing just now as, a, as an example, a lot of that is done as an art right now. You have your 10,000 meshes, and someone who's done this for 30 years looks at it and says, well, OK, but this one, that's not going to work. We're going to tweak that a little bit. Oh, yeah, and, and, and it all works. It all works magically. Well, you can't do that on 300 million elements. It's not going to happen. So now you have to have automated processes that clean themselves and find the incorrect things and make sure the convergence happens. And that's, that's not trivial. I mean, that's actually an enormous amount of work, but no one's getting paid to do that. That was all the pre-process stuff that, that, was mentioned, that was mentioned earlier. It's all the stuff that no one pays attention to. But it's crucial. If you do that badly, it doesn't work. So there's a real need to pay attention to sort of the details underneath the covers, not the stuff that shows up in a press release. All right. So I'm going to jump now to the ISVs and the issues that, that, that came up in, in that community. First. And I think that this is starting to change. So I think I'm, I'm very encouraged by the discussion we've had since these set of meetings. But um, 
There was a real lack of a clear business model as the architectures are changing. You know, I think the business models as they were envisioned hadn't anticipated million core count jobs, right? And so that it didn't, how do you value that? There is, that's a, that's a relevant question, you know, and there's not, I don't think there's a clear answer to that. I, I, I'm very encouraged by the different steps that companies have taken to address this, but I think it's, it's fundamentally a question of what is valuable and how do you value it and then how do you sell it? I mean, that's, that's business 101, right? So, so how do we value that commodity? Um, I don't think we have a clear answer to that. Um, I would certainly like to see, and I think I speak for the, for the council on this part, that we would like to see software licensing models that actually encourage the use of high-performance computing as opposed to discourage the use of high-performance computing. Um, you don't want some enterprising young scientist in your industry to be called into the vice president's office who says, you idiot, you spent all that computing time. That's the last thing you want. You want them to say, thank God you spent all that computing time because you discovered all this stuff. And right now, that's not what happens, right? I mean, you run up a huge bill quickly if you're not paying attention. And, and, and we would like to see business models that encourage people to play with computing rather than discourage people from playing with computing. Uh, it's clear that consistent access to HPC would accelerate the pace. And I think that that was made very clear by the examples that we saw earlier today, right? If you actually, if you get all the, if you get companies together, with a user who actually has a problem they're solving and you give them access to computing and access to the expertise, magic gets to happen. And, and we, we saw that absolutely. I think we, we'd like to see if we can expand that beyond, beyond a, a mere number of partnerships to, to a nationwide kind of thing. Um, ISVs, as I mentioned before, are also struggling to retain a workforce. Um, labs are an obvious partner, uh, obvious because, as I said earlier, we uh, of necessity have the access to the hardware and access to the talent and, and access to the software. Right? I mean, that's that, that we, we sort of are required to have all of that. But but there are there are issues, right? I mean, we're we're the government after all, and there are problems working with the government. There there uh, quid pro quos and provisos, right? Uh, um, so IP issues are a serious one, and and. A lot of people think this is all negotiable, right? It's like, well, you know, you can just negotiate with the government the way you would negotiate with a fellow industrial partner. But in fact, it doesn't work that way because the government doesn't negotiate very well. Um, they're just, there are just laws about how things have to get done. And those are, those are problems. I mean, some of those are, are, are barriers to how this winds up getting uh, um, uh, prom promulgated and disseminated. And then, of course, there are export controls. I mean, a lot of, a lot of people, and I mean, I probably weekly have a company coming into my office uh, asking to use some of our famous codes which are export controlled and and under certain conditions they can and under many conditions they can't and they don't like that answer but but hey I'm sorry that's that's you know there's a reason for that <laughs> okay academics so they have a whole different set of issues I mean we I spent you know we spent some time bashing the academics in the sense that they were not moving forward quickly enough to 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 teach students on new architectures of course they can hardly be damned for that they don't have access to that hardware so it's a hard thing to do but it's not their fault in some sense. The field is changing much, much faster than the faculty are changing, certainly. And it's very, very hard to change curriculum. Um, I'm currently involved in, a, in an exercise with, with UC Davis down the road from us, uh, trying to work with them to, to, to create something like you guys have it here at Illinois, which is a, a computational science and engineering thrust, which is now, which is now a discipline agnostic, right? So it's not, it's, it's not a physics program, it's a computational science program that has physics attached to it or has biology attached to it or chemistry attached to it. And, and that's, that's very hard to do because you start stepping on a lot of academic toes. And, and as Ed you know, so succinctly said earlier, you know, there's, no, there's no fight like an academic fight. That's, <laughs> so you don't, you don't do that casually. Um, institutional focus, of course, is on education and on pushing a science. It's not so much on developing a proprietary result for a company. So industry comes in with a perfectly reasonable expectation that they're going to pay X amount of money and they'd like someone to look at this problem. And what they're actually going to get is a grad student's going to publish three papers and maybe he defends his thesis. And, and, and the fact is that that's exactly what the university thought that they were getting paid for. That, that's what their job was. And so there's an often, there's a disconnect sometimes in what the motivations are between the various parties. Um, and uh, for IP policy, and this is, this is true for the government as well, I think, uh, IP policy is often, I, I would say, not understood. And, and, and you know, uh, I think it's not that it's not understood, so I want to temper that only slightly. People don't understand the different motivations. So many, many academic institutions, their, their role with IP is to make sure that stuff gets broadly disseminated, whereas industry often views IP as, as defensive. 
And those two are very different motivations for how you protect your IP. And because of that, they wind up talking across each other, even though they're saying the same things. It's, it's, it's frustrating to watch. Um, OK, government. And I, I do actually want to get off the stage at some point. <laughs> so Mohammed laughed when he knew I was going to be up here, because he said, yeah, Fred's just going to talk the entire time. <laughs> um, so government has a different set of issues. Uh, we, of course, look broad, broadly across the entire thing. Uh, our interest is in competition writ large. We want the nation to be more competitive, for which we need individual companies to be more competitive. And that's, that's industrial sectors as well as ISA. We need everybody to be more competitive. Um, the labs themselves, of course, have different primary missions. And I think that that's often confusing to industry. At least it's, it's, it seems that way to me as I've talked to people. Uh, the Office of Science Lab have, have uh, as, a, as a role pushing the forefront of scientific knowledge in this country, whereas the NNSA labs have as a role maintaining the safety, security, and reliability of our stockpile, which, is, which we do with a lot of science, but, but with a very different mission space. Because of that, working with an office of science lab versus you know, a Los Alamos or a Livermore is a little different, because the motivations for the two labs are different, even though the work may look the same. And again, motivations matter. So it necessitates dis different strategies. That there's, of course, a lack of a consistent approach, which I've heard, I heard over and over and over again, and I hear in my daily life, again, probably weekly, that people complain about, well, I had this agreement with Argon, and it looks very different from the agreement I have with you. Can't you just sign this? And the answer is, no, I can't just sign that. And, uh, and the same thing happens when you t take that agreement and walk over to Oak Ridge or you go to San Diego. They all, they all look different, and they shouldn't look different. I'm not going to defend that. That's, that's, that's something that I think should be fixed. But nevertheless, you know, I think much of industry thinks of the labs as the labs, and they don't realize they're actually completely different organizations. Um, the labs are geared for very large-scale projects. That's what they're really set up to do. And much of industrial work has a much shorter time frame than that. It's not unreasonable for an industrial partner to walk in, and, and, and this happens at NCSA all the time, and you say you work, you know, this is a two-month project, a four-month project, right? We talk about year-long projects, five-year-long projects. That's sort of the mentality inside the lab. And so it, it's hard to spin up a project in the laboratory and then spin it back down in only a couple months because it takes like five months to get it started. So it's... You know, you'd be over before you even started. It, it, it's awkward. And that's something we're also trying to change inside the laboratories, but it's something you have to be aware of, that, the, again, this, the scales are sometimes different. And then, as I mentioned earlier, the, the, the rights and restrictions are often, often limit the appeal of a partnership, but those are often workable points. So having said all that, um, I, 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 I quipped to Merle, you know, when, when we started talking about this, that this is, this is sort of like a... a, a I feel like a grief counselor in a sense. Uh, you know, first, the first thing is just accepting the pain. It's um, <laughs> going to this next generation of computing is not going to be easy. It's going to be hard. But I think it's really, really important that we do that. And we do that in as co coherent and coordinated a fashion as possible because some of, some, of our, some of our international competitors are being very coordinated about how they're doing that. I think it's clear that a purely government-funded solution can't work. Uh, there are too many restrictions on government dollars, both in where it can be spent and then what can be done with it, that I think limit the availability. And I think the beauty of something like the iForge machine, which I think really highlights the, the difference between you know, what you can do on Blue Waters and what you can do on iForge has to do a lot with the color of money that was used to purchase the machine. So these things matter. Um, getting everyone with a stake at the table is a must. I think it's, it's, it's clear that there, are, that there needs to be a business model that actually succeeds for everybody involved. I mean, uh, it was it Merle said earlier, everyone, everyone here is selling something, right? That's, that's the nature of commerce in the United States. You're selling something. And so there has to be a win-win for everybody involved. If there's a win that somebody winds up losing, that's not going to work. And as I've said several times now, the architectures that are coming up are going to make life increasingly different. So the time really is, is now to work toward a solution. Um, so with that, I was going to take what, what time is left. Uh, and ask two members, of the, so Cynthia, who sits on the council, has worked, I work closely with her to, to go through the working group meetings, and Mohammed from John Deere, uh, who also participated in, in several of the working group discussions, to just share your viewpoints, and then I would open it up for a discussion. Mom? Go ahead. Okay. Um, as Fred was saying, we had uh, very robust discussions during the uh, three regional meetings uh, last year. Um, one thing I'd like to add uh, for everyone's benefit is, is a little more of a historical perspective of, of the council's role uh, in bringing about some of the changes uh, 
in the uh, software uh, discussion. Certainly, uh, it was mentioned that five to seven years ago there was a meeting here, um, and my predecessor, Susie Titchener, was here, and I think it was co-hosted with uh, NCSA. Um, and seven years later, there is a change, that there's collaboration. And so we were part of that discussion, and many of you were part of that. Um, in 2008, uh, when, the Obama, uh, when Obama was uh, elected uh, to become president, his transition team came to the council and asked us, how can high performance computing be used for stimulus? And as a result of that, four companies, Caterpillar, Kevin Hofstetter, who's here, Tom Lang of Procter & Gamble, Paul Fussell of Boeing, and Rick Arthur joined together with the council, they are in the council, and we went around to the various departments and agencies talking about the use of HPC for manufacturing in particular. The, uh, the endemic project was really the result of that. We started in 2009 with um, discussion, education, advocacy that all manufacturers should have greater access to compute software and expertise for for the, for the U.S. competitive advantage. Um, the administration decided in 2010 to, to do a project for small and medium-sized manufacturers and to bring these three aspects, compute, software, and expertise, uh, in so that small companies could see the advantage of using those tools and having the expertise. The interesting thing that happened, we met with Department of Commerce, the National, uh, National Telecommunication and Information Agency, NSF, DOE, everybody. The only, only one we didn't meet with was NIH, and we sort of ran out of time. Um, we had a meeting with Arden Bement, and he was asking us, uh, asking the industry players, the four of them, about their software use. And, and Tom Lang said to him, he said, you know, we use a if we can, a lot of the DOE codes, and they, they are relevant to us, they're robust, but we don't use university codes too much, as a, just a general statement, you know, um, they aren't used. And Arden Bement, the director of NSF, was intrigued by that. You don't, he started asking questions, you know, they aren't supported, you know, You've got students who create them with faculty when the PhD is over, then the codes, you know, whatever, grandfathered. Or, and um, that was in 20, 2009, 2010. From that time to now, NSF sat down and said, you know, we should have some software institutes that will create, support, produce, software of interest, sustainable. And they came out with a solicitation this year for the first time. So the council in convening the companies and, and getting them in front of the government on the problems that could be resolved by government, not all problems, but some can made a difference. And so I want to thank all of them, all four of those companies, GE, CAT, P&G, Procter & Gamble, and John Deere. Oh, oh Lord. Oh, Lord. And John Deere. They always do that. And John Deere. The horse with the blinders on. And John Deere for making this possible, that the government paid attention, heard that software is a prime importance to U.S. productivity, and that people are now moving more strongly towards software institutes, software development, and the role of the federal government in doing so. And with that, I turn to my colleague, Wait, Muhammad. It's only five more minutes. There's only five more minutes? Wow. Muhammad. OK. So I think, we'll, I think I agree with Mohammed, as I always do, that uh, <laughs> I will, I will, let's open it up for discussion, because I, I am interested in hearing what some of the assembled wisdom thinks about possible paths forward. How do we, and I want to tee up the question like this. I mean, I, I want to come back to something Tom said during the earlier discussion. So the demonstrations that you saw in the previous panel 
you know, that was, a work, that was actually a fair amount of work to put these individual demonstration projects together. As Tom said, the companies need to do that like day in and day out. They need to be able to use computing at that scale to solve problems every day. How, how do we do that? How, why can't we do that now? And how can we do that uh, a few years from now? Mark. So I, I think the, the progress uh, demonstrated uh, with the PSP program here is, is outstanding. And, and I really agree with Tom's assessment that it, it, it's a phase transition. Um, and, you know, back to the painful part, um, the pain is worth it because, you know, the cu computing capability that is on the drawing boards right now for the next five years is absolutely astounding. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of reason to go out there um, and, and uh, take high performance computing to the next level. So, you know, the, you know, one of the roles that the council can do is to encourage, uh, you know, specific recommendations to come from uh, the council and to promulgate those ideas in the in uh, in, in uh, uh, the industry and also in, in government. And I would put forward that you know, uh, uh, replicating this type of engagement that's got the skills, it's got the computers, and it's got the codes. Uh, the software together to solve real problems for American industry is a model that should be replicated on a regional basis. And that, you know, where there is demonstrated progress, that progress be encouraged to take it to the next level. You know, the, uh, you know PSP is at gigascale with glimpses of, of petascale, right? So can we take the glimpses of petascale and turn that into a production capability at petascale while we're getting glimpses of exascale over the next five years? So I would certainly be in favor of, of standing up something like a regional computing center. I think that the, the, the model that was demonstrated here, which is, you know, s seed money from the government, but it's not, it's, they're, they're paying the first dollar, not the last dollar, right? I mean, that, they're, that there's private money that actually pays for the final work. I think that that's, that's a viable model, and I think that's sort of something that's worth exploring. Well, Fred, I, I want to add a little bit to what, what Mark just said, but put it in another context that you had brought up when we were at, at Berkeley. So I've been fond of saying that when we get the professional drivers in the room, and we know their names, they live here, it, you get a professional driver in the room and we can drive a supercar. I'm thinking about Top Gear, you know, you put the, those, those drivers into a, a Formula One car and they couldn't even get it off the line. The clutch, you can't even work right. So, and, but, so that was my favorite story about how, what we can do with supercomputers until Fred said that what we do with HPCs, we don't drive a faster car, we go by plane. So Mark, you, I think you just said that in so many words. We're, we have so much computing down, coming down the pike, it's going to change the game. We're not going to drive supercars, we're going to fly. Well said. I think the opportunity, the opportunity is there if we take it. Yeah. Any other comments, suggestions? How do we, how do we move past, past where we are? Um, No takers? Go ahead. Oh, Jerry. I've been doing this for a long time. <laughs> and the single thing I can, your presentation was tremendous. It's like a list of everything that for 30 years I've been running into, seriously. And the number one thing I could think of that maybe I could contribute in 10 seconds is if industry and universities don't figure out how to get on the same page is never going to happen. Because in brief, and you said this, in the university, the job is graduate the students, write a paper, get a PhD gone. My th advisor had a big number on the wall, dollars per PhD. That's how he thought about it. When I get to industry, it's how fast can I get something I can sell? I want to publish nothing. I want to keep it all to myself. Simulations I did were always a big secret. You get into back to the university. How fast can we publish? This has just been the same forever. And somebody has to figure this out. I wish I had an answer, but that's an answer we need. So I agree. I, I wish Rick were here because he, he actually led the group on, on workforce issues and he, he and, and he's always has he always has opinions. <laughs> So I was actually part of Rick's group for a little while before I retired, but um, well, from P&G. But um, 
What I would make the comment is, from our experience, is one of the changes that has to change with the academic side is the Gatorade effect has to go away. And the Gatorade effect is Board of Regents and states believe that they can fund their basic research through the proceeds from industry because the University of Florida did it. You know, they invented Gatorade, got a share of the profits, and then that's went on. Procter & Gamble has had is getting, we have a standing agreement with the state of Ohio, every academic institution. And the IP relationship is, you know, not that anything invented in the state is owned by the state, right? Procter & Gamble owns what we invent. Um, we have a standing agreement with the state of Michigan, same thing, standing agreement with the state of Purdue, or with the, with the <laughs> University of Purdue. You're right, you're right. <laughs> so you, what I would suggest is academic institutions that get this are changing their uh, intellectual property policies and that you as an industry need to go there and say, okay, you know, the, the concept is the spoils for inventing something do not go to the inventor. They go to the investor. So who takes the risk to commercialize an idea with the money is who makes the money. The inventor gets recognition and a nice living, but they are not the ones that are rich. Those people that go on, smart t on Shark Tank, the only ones that make real money are the ones that bring all their money to the table as well. I mean, it's the investors that make the money, and as long as the universities understand that, they're in the scholarship business, recognition business, right, and, they, and that the, board, the state of Ohio does not own an invention that, that a university professor collaborates with Procter & Gamble on. That is not going to happen, because the minute that's the terms, we're out of there. And that's an important, but I think it's changing. I think, but it's changing institution by institution, state by state. And I think every industry person, re-look at your university. You might get a different relationship than you used to. And then it's back to, you want scholarship? I'll give you a scholarship, we'll let you publish, but it'll be a toy problem. Um, and we will do our own problem in private, and that's what we won't publish, uh, and then we're all good. Just pick your toy problem so that it's real scholarship. Any other uh, thoughts on, on what would, so, so Merle made an interesting comment uh, at the very beginning of, of, the, of the previous panel that, uh, actually no, I think it was in, in, in your opening comments about iForge, that he quipped that you know, they, they couldn't, there wasn't sufficient interest in industry to simply invest blindly, that was the word you used, in, in a computer, so you did it yourself. And, and of course the results speak for themselves. I think that that's been an enormously valuable uh, utility. And, and yet the fact remains that companies did not invest blindly in a, in a computer. So if we were to put together something like a regional computing center, that's gonna require some level, of private, uh, some, some level of private funds. So is there an appetite for computing that would be accessible, that would solve problems at this scale? Or is that only possible if a government has paid for the computers? And I would posit that the latter is not a tenable solution. So <laughs> is there an appetite for investment? Fred, I'll accuse you of being a mouse in the room yesterday with our partners only. Yeah. <laughs> but we do need to get moving along to the next topic. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fred.